The title of today's message is True, True Religion. Now, I'm not talking about a very expensive pair of jeans with a very fat Buddha playing a guitar on it. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? That's not the picture that I have in mind when I speak of true, true religion. That's why I didn't say true religion. I said true, true religion. And, and so I want to talk about that today, true religion. And really, the Lord wants that kind of religion or that kind of faith from us. And so what is that? I want to take a look at that take a, and then apply it to us where we are and then broaden it out to the rest of the world. All right. What is the number one reason that people give for stopping coming to church? When you say, will you come out to church, what will they tell you that this is the reason why I can't come to church? I can't come to church because. And most often I hear this, and I'm not talking about people who've never been to church, and maybe some of them too, but mainly the, the big problem that they have is very personal. They say the church is full of hypocrites. I'm tempted to say, then you would fit right in. No, I'm kidding. But anyway, but, uh, but, uh, the church is full of hypocrites, full of hypocrisy. And we talk about peace inside, but when we're outside, we're fighting and we're biting. You know, all of these things that they see, the contradictions and, uh, and the hurt they see inside the church. And maybe some of you have left church and are just now coming back to church because you saw that kind of hypocrisy. Um, a, lot of, a lot of pastors' kids, the reason why they go awry and turn away is because they can't help but see the hypocrisy sometimes in their very own parents. And so I have to admit that. I need to be careful of it. And, and hypocrisy, uh, being two-faced, right? Uh, acting all holy in church and then and, uh, as if they, we agree with everything, but outside, we're, we're outside we, peep, we see people feeling very free to lie, to backstab and hurt and just seeking your own gain. And we hear about that and we see that, people see it, people see Christians do it, and they get turned off from the church. Do you hate hypocrisy? I think we should hate hypocrisy. And if you hate hypocrisy, I think you are in good company because God himself hates hypocrisy. God himself hates hypocrisy. Look at Isaiah 58, verse 1. Isaiah 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgressions, to the house of Jacob their sins. And I plan on doing that today. Yet they seek me daily, they're good churchgoers, they delight to know my ways, they're good Bible study students, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgment, they delight to draw near to God. At least so they seem. And then they say this, Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? God, why aren't you answering my prayers? Why didn't I make it to that college? Why am I sick? Why didn't I get that car? Why didn't I get that iPod? I've been praying for it. I've been, you know, sacrificing for it. I've been a good boy. Like that Christmas list, right? Santa Claus is watching. Better be, better, what? <laughs> better not shout. Better not pout. Better not watch. Better, yeah, okay. Anyway, <laughs> better watch out. Better not cry. Better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming. To and sometimes that's how people do Christianity. I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to, what is it? Better not, sh I'm not going to shout, I'm not going to cry, I'm not going to pout, and here's why, because I'm waiting for something that God's going to give to me. And so they have this attitude, and they have this heart, very self-seeking uh, process, and often it kind of hits us where we are, because we often come to God whenever we pray with, so, with something more or less of a shopping list, don't we? Please, I want this, please, I want that, and we think we do God a favor by coming to God with that kind of a prayer life. And it's all cast around this. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. You seek your own gain. 
and oppress all your workers. You seek your own gain, and you abuse the people around you. You oppress the people who work for you. Here it would be slaves or, or other things, and, and your workers, your employees. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight. You're, you're going through all of the religiosity, all of the rites of Christianity, but what are you doing? That's not showing in your language. You are using the same language when people cut you off on the road. You are cursing them and their generations to come. You are fighting all the time. You are bickering and you are wailing at one another. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Your life shows no, sh no sign of repentance or conformity to my word or to my heart. Then all your fasting, all your church going, even all your praying does not make your prayers to be heard. Is this the fast that I choose? A day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed? and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? God says, is this what I asked of you regarding your worship? To come to church week in and week out, to bow your head in prayer, to lift your arms in worship, to lift your voice? Is this the kind of fast that I've asked for? And he says, no. And if he defines the kind of fast or religiosity or religion or worship that he wants, is this not the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? This is the kind of fast that I want, God says. All right. There's a type of false fasting. What is fasting? Fasting is generally when you go without Food, when you go without food, when you deprive yourself of food. But the Bible gives us different kinds of fast. There are, there's a food fast, which we hate, and there is a food and water fast, which we detest. And, without, and, and in which state we stay, if we stay for more than three or four days, we die. <laughs> we need to eat, we need to drink, right? So, what kind of fast then... Uh, Am I talking about that is false fasting? I mean, you can go through, uh, if you choose to go fast, and I think it's a good habit to fast, to go without food, some of you need to fast more than others, you know who I'm talking to, okay? Don't, don't anybody look at me right now, okay, <laughs> at this point. But uh, sure, some of us need to fast a little bit more than others, but what is false fasting? Fasting is painful, and how, what a pity if it's false if it's pointless, if it's empty. Some of us can fast to be full of ourselves. You know, Some of us can fast and be religious to say of myself, I belong to this category. I am a churchgoer, and so I am a little better than everybody else. I take my family to church, and so I'm a little bit more stable than my neighbor who doesn't take, her, take his or her family to church. And so this kind, of, this, this kind of security, this false security we can find in going to church and going through the motions can have a very, very, very serious pull. It can be a very strong temptation, and it can become an idol. So you can go through all the motions of the church, you can go through fasting and things, and then end up being useless and pointless because it was all about you from the beginning. You're fasting food, so your stomach is empty, but you're still full of yourself, right? 
And there were a lot of people like that in the time of Isaiah. Apparently, they would come to church, they would even fast, but they do it in such a way that everybody knows so-and-so is fasting today. And so they do it so that they will be lifted up in the eyes of people. And having done that, they mess it all up by going out and defrauding other people, using weird tactics, fighting other people, bringing down other people, making it uncomfortable for other people people to be in their presence. It's like, wow, if, church is, if that's what church is about, no wonder a lot of people are not attracted, right? And that kind of fasting is pointless and worthless, Jesus says. That's what I call churchianity. That's what I call religiosity. But that is not Christianity. It is not Christianity. Christianity is true fasting. True fasting. Now, what is true fasting? He says here, this is the fast that I choose. It's so rich and wonderful. It's worth reading one more time. To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover him and not hide your face from your own flesh. True fasting is to share the heart of God, to know the heart of God in such a way that it finds expression in the way that you deal with people that don't have as much as you. They are not healthy like you. They are poor and disadvantaged. And to to them, your heart goes out and you start to express your Christ-likeness, your Christian charity, your love for the Lord to them. And as you do that, you find that you get to know God's heart better. You get to find out that you can love people like God loves. It is to know God in the service of others. That's how God defines true fasting. To let go of your own advantage, like eating, like money, like time, so that you could use that money You can use those resources, you can use that time to experience God in serving and loving others. That's the true principle of fasting. The true principle of fasting. Let me give you a few more verses here. Okay, let me see. All right. Let me get there right now real quickly. All right, here we go. True religion, love from a transformed heart. I was supposed to put that up in the beginning. I didn't miss it. Ah, Sorry. Okay. Here we go. True fasting. Okay. If you can read it, go ahead and read it with me. If it's too small, I will read it for you. Let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these things I delight, says the Lord. So when we serve others, when we love one another, when we know, and for the purpose of knowing God, that's where we experience Him. And that's a type of fasting, where we put aside other things so that we can focus on loving and knowing the Lord. This is talking about a righteous king. Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. Is not this to know me? Did you catch that? Is not this to know me, says the Lord. What is it to know the Lord? To be kings, to exercise your authority, to exercise your God-given position, to be kind and to be merciful, and to serve the people that everybody else steps on. This is to know God, because this is what God does. This is what God does. People in your care, serving and loving your children. Husbands, loving and serving your wives. Wives, loving and serving your husbands and your children. You know, often when you ask I'll I'll ask a mother who you know has one child, uh, well, you you thought she had one child, and she'll say, I have two. Why? Because she counts her husband in the mix. (laughs) 
<laughs> of, the, of the children. Okay. Every, some of you can really relate to that. Yeah, I, have, I admit, boy, uh, men's, uh, men uh, stay boys uh, to some degree. Boys will be boys uh, uh, forever, <laughs> pretty much. And so we need that. Yeah, they need that. And so we need to serve one another. We need to love each other. And when we do that, that's the process of knowing God. Loving others, serving others, is the process of knowing God. That's true fasting. When you stop feeding and serving yourself for a moment so that you can focus your attention, your love, your energy on someone else, that's knowing God. Okay? That's true fasting. Let me try to bring it home just a little bit more for you. Uh, For example, and the text here also talks about the Sabbath day, delighting in the Sabbath day. And we have a concept here called the Lord's Day, which is the first day of the week. We set it aside for worship, rest, and mercy. Say that with me. Worship, rest, and mercy. So the idea is that you would take one day out of seven. Some of, most people do like a 24-hour period. And some people, like me, I think of 6 o'clock to 6 o'clock. It's, it's roughly like that. Just to set, a, set it aside to just focus on worship, rest, and mercy. Don't you worship, rest, and, mer- and, have, and give mercy throughout the week? Of course you do. But you set aside a special day for worship, rest, and mercy. Say it one more time. Worship, rest, and mercy. And when you do that, a lot of us, what we do, one of the things we do is we don't do what we usually do throughout the week so that we can set aside this day. And that could include not spending money, not um, studying. Some of the students like that. I I enjoyed that growing up, taking a break from my studying. Sure. Uh, Those kinds of things, you can do that. You can, do, you can do. Also, it has a lot of positive things, reading a good Christian book, spending more time in God's Word, making sure that church th- takes priority in your life on the Lord's Day, that nothing competes with worship on the Lord's Day. So all those are really, really good things. But the problem with setting aside one day aside like that, that can feed directly into what I was just talking about, religiosity, churchianity. Because what do you do once you start doing what other people aren't doing? We easily start comparing ourselves to other people, right? And, and we, look at, we can easily point the finger at people who don't love this day like you say you do and say, oh, Sabbath breakers. And we're all Christians, but I'm on a higher level of Christianity than those guys are because I keep the Lord's day. See, that's religiosity, and that's churchianity, and we need to fight against that. That's legalism. That's trying to win your status and approval by what you do. We need to fight that, because we here are all about grace. It is not about us at all, or how good we are, or how well we do what we say that we do. It's not about that. That leads to division. That leads to arrogance. That leads to people pointing the fingers at us. And if Christians are supposed to be like that, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want to be arrogant. I don't want to be you know, high and holy. I want to live where I live. So, it can be like that. Then what is the key? Just let's take this, of of loving the Lord's day in such a way that it doesn't become a burden, it it doesn't become religiosity or churchianity, all these things that I just mentioned. I think it's to treat it like a date day, okay? A date day. Ruthie and I, we used to have, and I I, I long for these, uh, our daddy-daughter dates, Okay, daddy, daddy, daughter, date, day, either 3D or 4D, okay? 3D or 4D, 3D day is what it is. And if I spend time with Ruthie, then I need to focus on Ruthie, right? Husbands and wives, you should have a date night, right? But on date night, let's say that you go out with your husband, ladies, and then the, the, the men, you know, are checking out all the other girls in the restaurant. That's not good. Uh, guys kind of do that, I, I, I know, but that's just rude to do it in front of you, right? Um, sure, and ladies, if men, if your wife, you know, while she's dating you, she is thinking about that 
really cute guy in the park that shows up every time she's jogging in the morning throughout the week, that's a problem too, right? That's a problem also. It's still a problem if you're at your date, men, and all you can do is think about your work. You bring your work to the date, and your wife is not going to be happy about that. Ladies, isn't that true, right? And, and, and I could just go on and on and on and on, right? You don't bring your week onto your date. You don't do that. I used to think by the best, one of the best things to do on a date is to bring a book and read. I, I learned that was not a good idea. <laughs> I learned pretty quickly that that's a way to really turn off my date, to bring a book, right? You don't do that. Why? Because you want exclusive time. You want sp time spent alone with the person that you love. What is the Lord's day? This is our date day with King Jesus. Amen? Throughout the week, you have to spend time with other lovers or other people who are you, you may be tempted to love, but you refuse to love because you belong to Jesus. And you go throughout the week with those kinds of temptations. You go throughout the week meeting up with stuff that you have to do that don't necessarily have anything to do with King Jesus because you have to do them. It's your job. You do your work. You do it really hard. And yes, you do it for the Lord, just like the husband goes to work for the money, right? To feed his family and to care for the family. But if, you, if the husband says to the wife, wife says, well, you don't love me. Oh, yes, I do. You don't love me. Don't you see me working so hard to bring you the money? That doesn't work. The wife wants the husband, right? In the same way, what is the fasting principle on the Lord's day? You stop all these other things you're doing so they don't compete with your singular attention on God and knowing Him in loving others like Him as He does. Make sense, right? So you stop from all these other things for the sake of worship, rest, and mercy. Worshiping God with other brothers and sisters. Giving your body some rest because your Lord takes rest seriously. Sleeping a little bit early on that day. Refusing to get caught up with everything else you've been doing throughout the week. I mean, this is a real good incentive, students, to study really hard so that you could take a break on this day. Right? And providing mercy, being kind, being more generous than you have throughout the week, reflecting Jesus' likeness a little bit more on the Lord's day. That's the way to honor the Lord's day. Loving the Lord's day. I have a little clip on, on, on my YouTube channel. Loving the Lord's day. This is what it's about. And so you, I know some of you feel differently about the Lord's day. Not all of you sign on to it. But... Uh, as a part of this church, as a part of the culture of this church, how can we do it in such a way that we are not judging other people? Think of the privilege, just the joy of stopping everything else and getting to focus on your Lord and lover, King Jesus, and living with him and in him and like him throughout this one day of the week. Okay? Do you see that? Is that's the way to keep the Lord's day where you're not going to be judgmental. You're not going to be legalistic. You're not going to make a list and just kind of focus on that. Can I do this? Can't I do that? No. Well, how can I do more? How can I keep it better? How can I focus my eyes more on the beauty of the one that I love? Don't you do that? I know you, two, you, you people who have been in love, you guys are sick. You know, you look at each other's faces and you're just looking at every crease and cranny in the face and you're just loving that person, right? And your gaze doesn't, doesn't, doesn't turn. Yeah, you need to have times like that regularly. You need to set aside times like that regularly. I'm talking on a horizontal level. We need it on a vertical level with the Lord. All right. Enough on the Lord's day. He brings that out here as well. Choose to, choose to really, you know, just, and you can think about it differently than just coming to church on Sundays. That's basic. Uh, but just to, to, to keep this day as a day of reflecting on and being in Jesus in a special way. Hmm? Very simple. Very simple. And he talks about that. Really, if you just go through the motions without, the no, without a notion of knowing the one that you are called to follow and know. What's the point of that? Why are you wasting your time? That's what God says here in this text. 
Because you see, if you really honor and love the Lord's day, and you do the kind of fast, the fast principle of stopping regular things to focus on the Lord, he says, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. The things that you prayed about will come to pass, and your light will break forth. People will see it and not call you a hypocrite. And they will see a genuineness and authenticity in you. Your righteousness shall go before you, before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Before and behind you there shall be glory. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. Your fellowship with God will be restored. You will cry and he will say, Here I am if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, the speaking, uh, the speaking in wickedness. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. He'll transform your darkness. He'll transform your sorrow. He'll transform your hurt. He'll transform your loneliness into the glory of God and the celebration of his presence when you keep the fast principle in the right way. Ah, I love this passage. It's just so rich. And you will be like a watered garden, like a spring water whose waters do not fail. All right. And you will be absolutely restored. Wonderful, amazing promises here. All right. You hate it when your date is thinking about someone or something else, schoolwork or otherwise, when you are on a date. That's hypocrisy. He's pretending, she's pretending to be with you, but in his mind, her mind, She's, she or he is somewhere else. God hates hypocrisy. Jesus also hates hypocrisy. Matthew chapter 36, verse 26, Jesus says, These people draw near me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. These people draw near me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. He's quoting Isaiah, by the way. Same thought, same prophet. Isn't it hard to be consistent? We hate hypocrisy, but don't we see it in ourselves? We hate lying, but we lie to our own children. We make up stories to our kids, don't we? We hate pride, but we see pride creeping in and up in us all the time. And so when people are disappointed in the church, I usually come up with this line saying, the church is more of a, of a hospital than a resort, okay? It's a place where the sick people are. They're going to be more more sick people than doctors. That's the way it's meant to be. And I have to give a kind of a weak cop-out like that. And, and it is true. People who are hurting, people who are broken, those are the people that are supposed to be inside the church. But the pastor is no exception either. I just heard a testimony of a pastor, and he was talking about this. And I'm talking about somebody else now. Somebody else. Not about me, okay? Because <laughs> we're talking about hypocrisy, and I don't want to talk about me right now, okay? But he said this. One pastor came in one day to a huge hall, worship hall, by himself, went through the pews and cleaned up the programs. He was just picking up the programs. On the outside, he was looking good. He was fasting, right? He was foregoing going to work out so that he could serve the church this way. But on the inside, this is his testimony, true story. He was thinking, I hope one of the staff members comes in and sees me doing this. Uh, I am the senior pastor after all. It's it's, it's kind of uh, just coming up. What do you call that? You call that pride. You call that pride. On the other side of it, the pastor could have also thought this. Why do I have to do this? Why didn't somebody else do this? I'm the senior pastor after all. What's that? That's just pathetic. (laughs) That's just pathetic. And now I am being autobiographical. (laughs) I don't always think think this way, but this thought has occurred. And that pastor closes with this line, I'm sick, man. (laughs) And we all are, aren't we? 
I mean, we want to be consistent. When we worship God, we know it's real. And our hearts skip a beat when you hear the name of Jesus. When the tears are flowing down our eyes, those tears are real and those tears are hot. And we want to worship God more consistently. We want to come on the Lord's day and worship Him all the time. But we find we don't get here all the time. And we find this very big inconsistency, a war that is going inside of our hearts. That's what the Apostle Paul said. I know what to do right, but I keep on doing what's wrong. I know that I need to be a servant to my wife and to my daughter, but I keep on wanting to lord it over them. I know when I discipline my son, it's supposed to be an expression of love, but sometimes when I do it, I have to admit a little bit of self-gratification sneaks in. I hate that. Don't you hate it? Uh, Am I the only wicked one here? (laughs) don't you hate it when you hear such wonderful things in the scripture and you see how beautiful Jesus is and you find how ugly you can be to the very people that you love the most, the very people that you are most committed to and you hate the fact that you are misrepresenting Jesus, the one that has died for you. Let me give you a couple of tools, okay? A couple of tools. Feeling a little bit miserable enough right now? (laughs) I hope so, because I don't want to be the only one in this boat. All right, but um, let me give you a couple of uh, of tools to help deal with with this. First of all, your pastor. If you feel hypocritical at times, your pastor is in the same boat. There is not a single day that I preach that I'm not hypocritical. Let me tell you that right now, up front. If you expect me to be any certain way, you have some kind of ideal about what a pastor is going to be. I, I tell you right now, I will let you down. I'll let you down. It's real, and it's true. I'll admit it, straight up. And so will you, <laughs> if I expect you to be a certain way. That's why there's Jesus. Jesus has given you his heart. When we found it impossible to give God our heart completely, know that Jesus has offered up his life to God and has given you his heart, and he doesn't waver. And Jesus is the reflection of the Father's heart, and he has exclusively focused all of that on us. And the Bible says that Jesus neither sleeps nor slumbers. He's never falling asleep at the wheel, and he loves you like crazy, and his attention toward you, loved one, never falters. I will never leave you nor forsake you, Jesus says. The Bible says Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. It is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus that has not only made your success and growth in Jesus a probability, a probability, but he's even promised it. It's not only a probability, it's a promise that he will finish the good work that he has started in you. Hang on to him. He knew all the hypocrisy that would be in your life, and he's committed to you anyway. Trust him. Lean on him. And if others see you in your worst moments and call you a hypocrite, own up to it and point to the one who is not a hypocrite. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one. Jesus accomplished our heart transplant from the cross. He turned your stony and hardened heart into a heart of flesh. He invaded the heart of flesh. Do you see that that picture that I had up there from the the very beginning, the one that you have on? He takes that heart, that crusted, stony heart, and he breaks it. Yeah, And he transforms it into a boom, beating heart. (laughs) Isn't that good? Boom. And he causes that heart to beat for the heart of God. It is beating imperfectly yet, but it's made in the image of God. And that heart is beating in your heart right now. The Holy Spirit shaping it toward God's likeness. And believe that. Yes, you're going to discover hypocrisy. You're going to discover pockets of sin that you never knew existed. Selfishness and dirt. You know, I was listening to a, uh, a radio program, and then and he was talking about how child abusers and all these people. He said, what kind of animal does stuff like that? 
It has to be a different category of human being. But I want to tell you, the more that I discover about my own heart, the more potential for sin, that the seeds of sin that, has, has, that is and have been, has been always there, the more I realize, but for the grace of God, I would be there too. It's God's grace from the start to the very end. And he has done great work in me personally. I'm a work in process, but I'm also a work, you are also a work in progress. All right, let's apply this. There is great potential, probability, and promise for your growth in Jesus. On a personal level, by the power of the Spirit from a transformed heart, love the Lord's day. I would challenge you, love the Lord's day. Love the people that the Lord loves. Draw all of your energy and point it. Make this day a day that's special. Yes, you're going to fall short, but there's grace for that. Make this a day that is special, that you've set aside. Nothing else competes with worship, rest, and mercy. And you spend this day loving the Lord and filling it with His good things. Don't worry. Don't focus so much on the negative. Don't focus on what you cannot do. By the way, when you're occupied with what you want to do, the things that you don't do take care of themselves, right? Right? Let's say that you wanted to go to school on Monday, but daddy said to you, Iris, or mommy said to you, Iris, you can go with your sister to Magic Mountain, all right? You can go to sister with your sister on Magic Mountain on Monday. But mommy, I have school on Monday. It's okay. I'm going to let you go. When you go, to, and mommy says, I'll take care of it. It'll be, all, it'll be, all, it'll be on me. Is she going to Magic Mountain? Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Is she going to be thinking about school that whole day? Well, my mom said she's going to take care of it. She'll do the homework. She'll do whatever the hell needs to be done. So she can focus on... That's a weak illustration. I just realized. But anyway, on the Lord's Day, to be able to focus and love the Lord, focusing on worship, rest, and mercy. Fill it with God's good things. And things you don't do will take care of themselves. And you want to, just like on that date, you want to focus on the one you love, do it. Um, let's make it up really practical. And one way is this. We have the food pantry that's coming up. You take the good God that you saw on the Lord's Day. You know that, you know that, that like, when people don't know, it's like, good God. <laughs> they say, right, good God. That's right. You see the good God in your, on, on the Lord's Day. You take him. And you invade the rest of your week, your workplace, your school, everywhere with him. And one of the ways we do this as a family is the food pantry we do once a month. If you haven't done it uh, at all before, and even if you've done it before, come, join us. Let's just serve the community together. Let's be Jesus to this community. Is it going to take a little bit of, cost you your day off? Is it going to cost you, uh, you know, in gas? And, and so, yeah, sure, but we minimize the cost. So it's as little of a sacrifice as possible. But come, and we'll work together and love together and know Jesus together. Isn't that what church and family is about? Mm -hmm. Let's broaden this out. And I'm sorry that I just have to spend just so little bit of focus on this. But reaching out to the world, let's not be satisfied with just this community, but let's be globally focused. I'm praying that, the, that, the, that Christians will continue to have a reputation of giving more to charity than atheists give. An atheist came up with this question. He said, statistically speaking, Christians do give more generously <laughs> to, than atheists do. And they, so he was trying to encourage the atheists to be more charitable. But really, Christians, you have a real reason to be charitable because this is your father's heart because he is so generous and he gave himself completely for you. If you are his child, you want to be generous. You want to end up like people like I know who have become reverse tithers. What do they do? They give away 90% of their income and live on 10%. Yeah, they probably get audited every year. But anyway, that's the way they live. They give away 90% and they live off of the 10%. That's good. That's good. What do we do here at the church? We participate, of course, in the other programs here, uh, around here. One of the things that we do is, um, is this. Oh, I had all of these for you, didn't I? 
Oh, look at this. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. This is true religion. Ah, oh, I love it. And this is what you are in Christ and what you are striving for. This is what we are doing as a church. If you see all these pictures on the hallways, you may have wondered what they are. These are the children that some of you are sponsoring on your own. These are all the various children all over the world. There's Nicaragua, there's India, and different places. And I would encourage you, if you're not doing it right now, do it. Sponsor a child. Uh, no, I, I'm not sure exactly how much it is up to now, $30 or $40 a month. And uh, with your family, it's a wonderful thing to do. I would encourage you to do it. Let me introduce you to a couple more kids. This is Paula Zimena Guiabo Vasquez, all right? She's one of the kids that we sponsor here. Here's, here's another kid. His name is Peterson Alfred. His face just, do you know why, I, you know why we chose him? His face said, sponsor me. <laughs> that's what it said. And he's saying it still because he's, that's closer to where he is now. Over the years, he's grown a bit. Okay? And especially those of you who can't really afford, I know you students, you can barely afford that ramen you eat every day, <laughs> right? But uh, why don't you just join the church in doing this? Because these are the two kids that we're sponsoring. Well, how do you do that? There's a lonely donation box in the middle of the hallway, and you could just give, save up a little bit and give on the weekends to support these kids. Now, if you don't support them, am I going to go like this? If you don't support them, these two kids of ours will starve. No, I'm not, because <laughs> they're not going to starve. We're going to pay for them no matter what. But you get the privilege of participation. Amen? Yeah, to be Jesus to them. And so, and there you go. Um, all right. Last word. All right. Finally, um, this is where I am. If you have never fully made a commitment to Jesus, and if hypocrisy was what was holding you back, I want to say to you that we are all, I want to say this first, sorry. I'm sorry that the church has misrepresented Jesus to you. I'm sorry that we've been inconsistent. And yeah, you're probably right. We probably acted one way in church and acted, spoke and lived completely differently. And maybe even hurt you more than people who don't believe in Jesus do. But we are a work in process. Imagine how bad would we would be without Jesus. And I want to tell you, Jesus is awesome. And Jesus died for people just like us and just like you. And I'm praying that you'll join us. Let's pray. Lord, we are inconsistent. Lord, we are hypocritical. And we are every day in desperate need of your grace. And King Jesus, you have been absolutely perfect in your love for the Father, in giving your heart to us, so that our stony, rock-hard hearts are broken and transformed into moldable, shapeable hearts of flesh, living hearts of flesh. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but you made us alive in your resurrection power. Help us to live in that power today. When we think about how beautiful you are, we, we wonder why we keep on falling back into our old ways, into our old thoughts, into thoughts of discouragement and despair and depression. And we hate that. And that drives us even deeper into our despair. King Jesus, you lift up our eyes to you. There is somebody here today, Lord, that is struggling with these issues of desertion. They feel deserted and they feel desperate and they're feeling depressed. Let your voice penetrate the darkness. Lift his eyes to you draw her gaze to you and you do this for your glory and as we continue to turn our eyes to you every lord's day and throughout the week 
I pray, Lord God, that you would cause us to be more and more consistent, less and less hypocritical, until proclaim the truth of the beauty of King Jesus with our words and lives. In your name we pray. Amen.